Good day and welcome to this continuing series on improving your reimbursement from the Practice Protection Committee. I'm Pat Bailey, Medical Director for Advocacy in the DC office, and I'm again very pleased to be joined by Mark Saver and Charlie Mabry. Mark and Charlie, thank you again very much for being with us. Thanks for having us, Pat. Thanks, Pat. So you guys are both just a wealth of information on this topic. And I, before we really formally get started here, I was wondering if you could share with our audience where it, was, where it was that you came by all of this knowledge, how you acquired this, and, and the way that you've applied it in your own practice. Uh, for me, I learned a lot of it from Charlie. Uh, Charlie Mabry has been doing this for years. He's put out uh, information for practicing surgeons uh, back to the days that I viewed it on CDs. Well, you know, my, my career started back when I was a young surgeon. I, I was actually on one of the Committee on Young Surgeons, and I was appointed to the this new committee that started in 1992, the Coding Reimbursement Committee. And, and, and at the time, little, most of what we know was, was about just billing and, and that sort of thing. But over the years, coding, how to code correctly, how to get proper reimbursement was part and parcel of our committee. And over the years, uh, many members of the, many fellows of the college have really contributed to what I know. Uh, and, and it's not to be forgotten that much of what we now do in our committee comes from questions of the fellows when they call in on the coding hotline, they'll send emails into the uh, college, the advocacy division, and then they'll send that out to the various committee members. But we, we actually listen to the fellows and try to respond back as much as we can in a helpful way uh, to the questions or problems that they have about reimbursement, coding, uh, regulatory uh, issues, et cetera. So the uh, the General Surgery Code Reimbursement Committee is still a very active committee. Uh, and for the fellows, uh, the takeaway message is we listen. If you have a question, send it in and we'll try to help you. That's Thank great, you. Charlie. I think that's important information for everyone to have. And we look forward to what you and Mark are going to share with us today. Yeah, Pat. And in addition to what we've learned on the Coding and Reimbursement Committee, both Charlie and I had our own experiences in private practice to learn this stuff. And, and in addition, I, I asked some, some uh, surgeons who have spent long careers in private practice about particular issues that they've had. And, and I just wanna mention that Eileen Natuzzi, John Tomasula and Brad Huggins have contributed some of the ideas that have gone into this presentation as well. So, so Pat, there's really two ways to think about improving your reimbursement in a fee-for-service model. And we've, we've broken them down into the buckets of either you learn to work harder or you learn to work smarter. And the, the first bucket, learn to work harder, is there's really not a whole lot of ways to do that. Basically, we're talking about you generate more RVUs. So, so Pat, when we're, when we're talking about generating more RVUs, it, it, really all you can do is become more efficient. I mean, certainly surgeons are already working a lot of hours and, and uh, working very hard during those hours. And so, so there's, there's a few ways that surgeons can think about maximizing their efficiency. The main source of your income is your, if for most surgeons is the operating room. And so maximizing operating room efficiency is probably the most important point to make. But don't overlook your clinic efficiency and then consider all of your non-RBU generating activities and are you getting anything for those? Under the topic of work smarter, we've come up with a, a lot of things that fall under this. And, and in this talk, we'll cover what we have in the first column here. And in another talk, we'll come back and, and talk in more detail about what we've got in, in the second column here. So the, the first thing that comes up on maximizing your efficiency is maximizing your build RVUs. Um, and we can't stress this enough. You need to make sure that your coding is done properly. Um, this is far and away the most important thing that you can do. And Dr. Mabry had done in the previous talk that offers you ways to, to consider how you do your coding properly. So if you didn't see that, go back and look at this before you go any further into this lecture. The second thing that you can do 
is to improve your average conversion factor. And there are really two ways to go about doing this. One is the rates that you get as a, as a contracted uh, provider with your insurance companies. And the second is the mix of patients that you get with the different payers. The graph on the left illustrates this. So typically your practice costs are about at or above what you get from Medicare and Medicaid. Now you can't negotiate better rates with Medicare and Medicaid. They don't negotiate those, but you can negotiate depending on your bargaining position with commercial insurances. And you can see how if you change your payer mix, you, you change where your overall payment falls on this graph. Let me add something to that. This is a great slide you've got together for the fellows to look at. And one of the ways, so people look at this and say, well, I may not be able to negotiate you know, a good factor on just a single surgeon or two or three surgeons in a small group. One way you can help yourself and also help the, the, the vast majority of patients is you have to remember that Medicare and Medicaid patients uh, are a, a smaller percentage of the whole patient mix. And if you are not successful in your practice, then you will fold and you won't be able to offer services to anybody. So therefore, it's not just a, a self-preservation concept. It's, a, it's a really an equity concept for all your patients to try to be successful and, and not uh, go in the hole and not have to close your business. Well, what are the ways to do that? One way would be to think of this graph and, and assign the slots in your clinic accordingly. So for instance, uh, we, we would never say don't see Medicare, don't see Medicaid patients, or it may be the, uh, the, the, a bad insurer that doesn't pay very well. We want you to see those patients, but you have so many slots in the day, you may want to think about reserving so many for the, the low paying patients and so many for the high paying patients. So for instance, if you have, let's say you have 10 slots, you might say we have one or two for Medicare, Medicaid, and one or two for a low paying insurance company. And then the rest of the slots that day are open to the higher paying mix. Now you still see those patients from every company, but the patients from a lower paying mix may be put off for two or three weeks instead of being seen that day. Now it, it may seem unfair, but actually what you're doing is you're, you're allowing your, certain, your practice to be open to patients from insurers that pay more and therefore it keeps the doors of your practice open, allowing you to treat everybody, including the, the Medicare and the Medicaid patients and the lower paying commercial insurance patients. So that's just one factor to think about allocating your slots in your clinic accordingly so you're, you can keep the doors open. And, and Charlie, if you run that thought a little further, what the market then should do uh, is that because the patients with the best insurance have the best access, there might be a higher demand among patients and their employers for that better insurance. And it might actually shift some patients into those higher paying commercial insurances in your community. Well, well that's right. And, and this is one way a, a single solo surgeon could put pressure on a big insurance company. If they're insured, keep complaining about, we can't get in to see Dr. X, uh, it takes so long. And then when they contact you, you say, well, you're, I'm losing money on every patient I see of yours. If you would just raise your rates to X, Y, and Z, that would allow me to keep my doors open and keep in practice. Well, it, it, it helps you gain leverage for that. This slide illustrates some of the, the things that we hinted at in an earlier slide about non-RVU generating activities. The, the point of the pie graph on the left is to illustrate that payment to physicians is really only a small portion of the healthcare dollar and that the majority of healthcare dollars goes to hospitals and other facilities. And often things that you do make them money, but don't necessarily make you money. The best example is ER call. If you're not getting a stipend for ER call, your hospital is making money off of you on those patients that comes in and and it's your time and effort that is, is being essentially given away. So, so for these non-RVU generating duties, and besides ER call, there are committee memberships, there are 
Um, in academia, there are education related activities. Um, there are a lot of activities that don't have an RVU value assigned to them that somebody is getting something from. And if it's not you, you're giving away your value. I think that's right, Mark. I think one way to think about it is surgeons in many, many community hospitals uh, create value. The challenge is for them to realize that and then claim the value that they created. Along those lines, that facility reimbursement often exceeds the professional reimbursement to surgeons. If you understand this, you may be able to take advantage of facility-based reimbursement in certain instances. So if you're a private practice surgeon, oftentimes there is value in being a partial owner of a facility, such as an ambulatory surgery center. Um, there are a lot of uh, surgical subspecialties that are very imaging dependent, where the surgeons have found that an ownership share in the imaging that they use is often advantageous. And then surgeons have found significant reimbursement from rehabilitation and post-acute care, um, and then wound care centers. Now, the caution about all of this is that much of this is no longer possible. There are laws that very much limit the amount of uh, entrepreneurialship that, that surgeons can get involved in without uh, crossing a legal line. So if you're thinking about doing this stuff, make sure you consult with an attorney and an accountant uh, about how this can be done. I would just add specific on imaging facilities, the, the stark rules and regs prohibit that if it's an outside facility. If you, if you have an imaging facility within your office, within your practice, it's, it's legitimate to refer patients to that <clears throat> with some provisions. But if it's an outside entity that you're buying ownership of, you yourself cannot refer to that entity. Right. And then for ambulatory surgery centers, there are very strict ownership laws that, that uh, are designed so that if you are an owner in the ambulatory surgery center, you also have to have a certain percentage of your work done in that ambulatory surgery center to make it legitimate. I wanted to just give an example here, Pat, of um, how facility reimbursement that for procedures that can be done outside of a hospital facility can be very advantageous. Um, on the left, I put the, the RVU values for laparoscopic cholecystectomy, a common surgical procedure done in a facility. The, the professional reimbursement for that comes from 19.0 RVUs. Now, a common procedure that can be done in, bo in both inside a facility as well as in a non-facility setting in, in a lot of cases is, is venous laser ablation or endovenous closure ablation. There's two separate CPT codes here, but I put the, the laser ablation one here. Mm -hmm. So if this is being done in a facility, the uh, reimbursement is eight RVUs. But if this is being done outside of a facility, the reimbursement is considerably higher. And that's because it reflects the additional reimbursement for the equipment and the disposables that are used for it. And because of the way the rules are written, this is actually quite advantageous to the professional who is doing this in his own facility because it far more than covers those costs. So in, in this part of the lecture, we covered um, the two sides of the coin, working harder and working smarter. We touched on a few uh, a few strategies for, for working smarter, and uh, we talked about working harder. And, and in our next part of this, we have several more work smarter tips for you. So Mark and Charlie, thank you very much for providing this informative discussion about working harder and working smarter. I just had a couple of questions that I think might clarify a couple of points and provide additional information. I was wondering if you might be able to discuss with us some other examples of non-RVU generating activities that surgeons should be compensated for completing. My favorite one, and I'll let Mark, you know, chime in after, after we get through, but the favorite thing I think to avoid is being a champion 
uh, you know, champion, when they want you to be a champion of an idea, it means that no one else wants to do it and they want you to do it without pay. So uh, being a champion of some event or some movement is okay, it's fine, but realize it takes your time and you need to be compensated appropriately because if your time is, is captured by being a champion, you're not in there operating in an OR, you're not seeing patients for the clinic. So make sure that they actually pay you for championing some idea uh, an appropriate amount for the time that you spent. Yeah, Charlie, I, I think you said it great. And, and I think that it, that applies whether you're an independent practitioner or a salaried or RVU based employee. If you're an independent practitioner, there should be a direct financial compensation to you for that. And if you're on some sort of an RVU based contract, there needs to be some downward adjustment of your RVU base to account for the time that you're taking away from your clinical practice for all this other stuff that they ask you to do. Great. Another question for you guys is, is I know from my own time in, in private practice that you just you seem like you could never do enough of making sure that your coding was done properly. And I wonder if you could share with us what you think might be a best practice, either in terms of how frequently you're doing it or what percentage of your coding you're checking. I think how the coding is done varies dramatically across the country. Everywhere I go, I, I ask how the who does the coding, how it's done, and it, it's quite variable. If someone is doing all your coding for your operative procedures, then I think it's important every so often to just simply look at the op note and compare what was sent in to make sure that it reflects what you do. In the uh, lecture I did previously, talking about how to, how to code better, one of the things I think is very helpful is to for a complex operation particularly, get out the CPD code book, see what the codes are you think are appropriate and actually dictate those into the, the, the header for the, the post-op operation performed and dictate those in. That way you, you know what the CPD codes are. Also, it helps you train yourself to understand what the language is in the book. So for other people reviewing your op note, they recognize what you're saying <clears throat> and also over time, it prevents people from un, uh, inappropriately denying your, your coding because it's right there in the operative board. You, there can be no question about what you think the right code is. Yeah, and, and I would just add, Pat, that, that ideally it would be great for you to do all of your own coding and review all of your own coding and what, what gets reimbursed for it. But for most of us, that's not really practical. But you need to have some sort of an audit system set up uh, and it's not that you have to do all of it, but someone independent of who did the coding should go back and relook at and audit some of the coding and go over with you where they find discrepancies on a, a monthly or a quarterly basis at the, at the outside. Well, one more helpful thing is to ask the whoever does your coding and billing, uh, once every quarter, say, perhaps, you will see all the denials of your coding because it could be that you're, you're, asking to code something that is absolutely prohibited. And every time they code it, it just gets denied. So it, it helps you learn, but also it helps you detect things that should be argued about, should be uh, asked to be reviewed, as opposed to them just saying, oh, it's denied and just writing it off. So reviewing your denials is a very important thing to learn how your coding is being handled once it gets outside the coding group and goes on to the insurance company. And Pat, Charlie and I are gonna provide some more detail on that, including some examples in, in our follow-up to this lecture. Well, great, Mark. We look forward to that continuing discussion about improving our reimbursement beyond coding. And we thank you all for joining us for this section, and we hope that you will join us for our future endeavors. Good day.